The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon from Columbia. It is August 27, 2015, and SCR is getting ready for a joint conference in Hilton Head with the North Carolina Realtors in a couple weeks. Today we have two very special guests. Bernie Maybake is currently a member at the Nex and Pruitt Law Firm, specializing in economic development, state and local taxation, tax controversy, tax law, and public finance. He is a two-time former director of the South Carolina Department of Revenue under Governors Mark Sanford and Governor David Beasley. Bernie has also served as the chair of the South Carolina Tax Realignment Commission, TRAC, in the South Carolina Transportation Infrastructure Study Committee and on the boards for multiple civic organizations. He's been recognized by the Columbia Metropolitan Magazine as one of the best lawyers in the Midlands for 2015 and best lawyers in America for tax law. He's a two-time recipient of the Order of the Palmetto and has, co has authored countless books and law review articles. We're very honored to have him with us today. Partnering with Bernie today and also a member of the Nex and Pruitt Law Firm is Tushar Cheek Leaker. Tushar's experience in corporate law, economic development, public finance, and startups. Through his work in economic development, Tushar has represented a diverse group of companies, both domestic and international, in connection with numerous economic development projects throughout every region of South Carolina, including some of the largest economic development projects in the state's history. Tushar has assisted with the drafting of South Carolina legislation providing for new economic development incentives or modifications to those already existing in advancement of his clients' interests. He's also counseled clients working through the South Carolina Freedom of Information Act issues affecting economic development projects. Thank you both for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here with us today. Now we'll hand it over to you. Uh, we're here today to discuss property taxes. Um, I can't get it won't go forward. Y'all hang on. We're here today to discuss property taxes and one income tax credit. We're going to be covering a whole lot of material, so we're going to roar through the uh, roar through these slides. As you know, to state the painfully obvious, you don't get paid until the property closes. So it's just as important if you represent the seller to know these incentives as if you represent the buyer. Location Matters, which is a, a publication annually done by the Tax Foundation and KPMG, they issued their 2015 report yesterday, and South Carolina did dismal on it. South Carolina was 46 in the country on certain manufacturers, was 49th on warehouse and distribution, and was 50th on retail, the highest property taxes in the country on retail. So you have to know these incentives. I contacted KPMG when they issued their report last year, and they told me that almost exclusively the reason South Carolina fared so poorly was because of our, our high property taxes. And, uh, and our high property taxes has, has badly skewed how South Carolina does on this report. The Location Matters does report only included the manufacturer's abatement tax incentive for manufacturers. It did not cover fee and lieu. So South Carolina can do far better than, it, on, lo than on Location Matters so long as uh, you uh, you pursue these incentives. Tusha and I are gonna, uh, happy to give you you and your clients 30 minutes on our dime. Uh, we cheerfully do that because occasionally we get hired afterwards. So if you ever uh, have questions about the incentives, if you want to call us individually or if you want to call us with your clients, we're, we're happy to do so. I have two uh, economic develop. I have two listservs. One is on economic development, and the other is a realtors listserv. If you're on the Realtors Listserv, we do three LLR certified seminars a year. They're free. Uh, they're purely for commercial and industrial Realtors. We don't cover any residential topics. Uh, but if those interest you, just email email me and my uh, my email address is on the uh, bottom of the of the PowerPoint. If you have questions, if you'll save them for the end. But if you'll type the questions as you go along, otherwise you're, you're just not going to remember them. And we're happy to stay an additional 30 minutes after this if we have that many uh, questions. So we're going to go over a number of topics, and I'm going to start roaring through the slides. First is legislative update. Um, the General Assembly did two things at the very last days of the legislative session, which was ended in June. First of all, on the historic preservation tax credit, you can now elect, instead of the existing 10% tax credit, you can take a 25% tax credit, not exceed a million dollars. So for any small and medium project, that's always going to be a better credit. They also quickened the time you can take it. You can now take it over three years versus the old five. 
and in a very bold move, they basically said you can allocate the credit any way you want in your LLC membership agreement. It doesn't have to comply with the Federal Internal Revenue Code um, subchapter K provisions. It also, uh, and I'm not, uh, it also allows you to pass through the credit to a tenant where you meet the pass through election under Section 50D, and don't ask me about that. They also amended abandoned buildings. Um, the abandoned buildings and insurance company can now take that credit. You can take it in three years versus five years. You used to have to stretch it out over five years. And they eliminated the 50% uh, limitation of your uh, income tax. So you could you could wipe out the, the heart surgeon can wipe out her entire state tax liability in one year. Uh, and it made it easier to certify the building meets the abandoned building requirement. A Fairness and Lodging Act, there was a lot of concern, unfair competition by people who rent their homes. Uh, they don't pay accommodations tax, they don't go through y'all, they do it. So the, the act allows counties to insert their reporting responsibilities into property tax bills and gives the DOR the authority to sort of crack down on it. You used to be able to rent your residence for just 14 days and there was a lot of litigation over that. But you can now rent your residence for up to 72 days a year and retain your 4% assessment ratio and that's, that's huge. Um, the Real Estate Commission, a lot of agencies are starting to get frustrated. A lot of the, of the sub-components of LLR are starting to get frustrated with LLR. The Board of Accountancy had legislation passed two years to partially get them from out of LLR. And uh, y'all got your uh, provision changed. The, the investigations have to be done within 150 days and LLR has to publish a report. Next, is we're going to go into property tax basics. Thanks, Bernie. So as Bernie said earlier, we have um, uh, some of the highest property taxes in the entire country, and it really does affect us when we're recruiting industry here in South Carolina. I'm sure all of you all have run into these issues yourselves. So what we want to do, um, before you can really understand what, you know, what property tax incentives actually look like here, you have to kind of have a basic understanding of how property taxes are traditionally calculated. So we're going to lay out at first um, the property tax standard calculation, and then we're going to touch on a couple of the larger property tax incentives, some of the more glamorous, more well-known ones out there. So first, on basic property taxes, um, this is your standard property tax calculation. So you take the fair market value of the property, you multiply that by the assessment ratio, and then you multiply that by the millage rate. So it's a three-factor formula, and that gives you your property tax bill. And that's important to remember. That's basic knowledge you need to know. Um, I'm sure most of you know anyway, um, and we'll come back to it to, to talk about how the incentives affect each of those variables. First, fair market value for real property. It's, it's generally appraised to determine the fair market value. There are some exceptions like agricultural real property and then real property that's in a fee and low tax arrangement. Um, but these are some of the standard principles for valuation. Um, you know, generally, it's reappraised every five years, but a county can delay that uh, reassessment. Um, there are some caps on the ability of a county to, to raise the fair market value of property, um, but th those caps don't typically apply whenever there's an assessable transfer of interest that Bernie's going to talk about a little later today. Now, on personal property, um, you know, for manufacturers, there's basically you start at cost, original cost, and then you have a fixed annual statutory depreciation rate uh, down to a residual value. And, and that's really based on statute, and it, it depends on what kind of a business this manufacturer might be. So the standard rate is 11% a year um, down to a floor of 10%. And then you see for aerospace and some other industries, there are slightly different, uh, more, more um, aggressive depreciation schedules, but the standard is 11%. And again, that floor is down to 10% of the original cost. For merchants and other businesses, it really starts at cost, and then you just look at income tax depreciation to get you to, down to that residual value. Now, assessment ratios, and this is one of the things that really uh, trips up South Carolina, um, but assessment ratios, this is a second variable, um, it are actually found in the state constitution, and that's why you know, there's been a lot of discussion about lowering property taxes um, and specifically changing the assessment ratios. Well, one of the challenges to doing that is procedural, and that is, we actually would have to amend the state constitution to affect some of these things. And that, as we all know, requires um, a significant, um, significant action by the General Assembly. Um, and uh, so as you can see, for manufacturers particularly, um, the assessment ratio is very high. It's 10.5%. 
uh, on both real and personal property. Same would go for utilities. Um, uh, for, com uh, for commercial properties, um, the real property assessment ratio is down to 6%, um, warehouse and distribution at 6%, but personal property is still up at 10.5%. So for some of you that are, that are representing companies that are, that are purely commercial, to the extent that they have high pro personal property investment, um, property taxes can still be a major issue for them. Um, manufacturer's assessment ratio, again, is something that really, really, um, uh, you know, triggers issues for us on the property tax side. 10.5% um, on both real and personal property, but there are exceptions. Um, and these are some exceptions that not a lot of folks know about. We've, we've had, Bernie and I have had success representing companies and working through some of these issues. Um, just because a building is owned by or leased to a manufacturer doesn't necessarily mean that in the standard property tax world, it's going to be subject to this high assessment ratio. If, if the building is, is used for R&D, or if it's an office building, or if it's warehouse and wholesale distribution, as you can see from the slide, there, there are certain instances when the lower 6% assessment ratio can come into play. So even in the non-fee and lieu incentive world, this is something that manufacturers should be paying attention to. Millage rate, that's your third uh, variable. I think everybody's pretty, pretty familiar with millage rate, but that's basically you know, the combined individual millages of all the various taxing entities that levy tax on a particular site. So largely, you know, most, most of the millage is typically the school district. You certainly have county millage, and then to the extent that a property is in a city or um, a town or a special purpose district, that millage is layered onto it as well. So that's the third variable. Um, now, in, in, in the property tax world, also a major concept is rollback taxes. I mean, this, I'm sure you all have faced these issues before, and it, it sometimes can, can sneak up on individuals if you're not aware of it, for sure. But agricultural evaluation is actually based on 1991 values. Um, as I said earlier, it's not subject to appraisal the way that other property is. And so as a result, the valuation is extremely low. Um, but and that's great if, if you if you have if you're you know running a farm for instance. But once that property is sold and there's a change in use, perhaps to a manufacturer to an office building, then rollback taxes could kick in, which would actually um, be a significant amount of money. Um, so it would be basically the difference between the ag use type of valuation taxes and what the property would be taxed at if valued like other property in that taxing district. And it's not just for the year of the transfer. It's for that year or change in use, but also the five preceding years. So that can be a big number. So those are the basics of property tax. Now let's talk about how we go about reducing those. And in certain cases, um, we have to do that just to be even in the same, even in the discussion with site selectors and other brokers and developers um, who are looking at, at, at buildings in South Carolina. Um, the, again, you look at your standard property tax calculation, and the fee in lieu is really your glamour of property tax incentive, which I'm sure most of you have heard of. And it affects all three variables in the property tax formula. It affects your fair market value, assessment ratio, and millage. So just some basic concepts on fee in lieu. Now feel free to ask any questions later or, or after the fact. But some basic concepts, um, one would be the investment period. This is the period within which new investment uh, that's made by a company gets the benefit of the reduced property tax rate that a fee and lieu gives you. So for, for normal standard projects, that period is roughly five years. For larger projects, uh, that period can actually be eight years. Um, also, that it can be extended up to another five years. For certain, for certain very large projects, it can actually go out to 15 years. So for those large projects, for instance, um, any new investment made during the 15-year period can actually get the benefit of this drastic property tax reduction. So it's a very good incentive from that perspective. Not only, and it's not just a one-time incentive, you can actually have a, a term of up to 30 years, and in certain cases, 40 years of reduced property taxes for each annual increment of investment made during the investment period. So for, during the investment period, if you have a 15-year investment period, for instance, each, years of, each year investment during that 15 years gets the reduced property taxes for 30, sometimes even 40 years. And that can actually also be extended. Now let's talk about how the fee and lieu actually generates the savings. Now I'll try not to get into the weeds here, but on that first, first formula, um, first variable in the formula, fair market value. As I said earlier, outside of the fee and lieu, it's typically based on the assessment by the OR or county assessor. Inside of the fee and lieu, though, it traditionally lock, it locks in at the um, original cost. Now, that might not be a good thing 
Um, and, 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 and so, you know, back when the economy uh, was going great guns and property values were, were rising, then that was a good thing, certainly. But now with property values, particularly manufacturing properties, dropping over time the value, um, you know, this is not necessarily a good thing. So we actually have some provisions that allow for uh, appraisal to kick in. For machinery and equipment, it's generally the same inside and outside of the fee. Now, the second assessment, uh, second variable is assessment ratio. This is the killer for South Carolina, particularly for manufacturing and, and commercial real property, uh, commercial personal property. As you can see, it's 10.5% in, in certain of these instances. What the fee in lieu does is it actually, on both real and personal property, takes that assessment ratio down to 6%. So for a manufacturing client, it, that's going to take your property, your, your, your assessment ratio down from 10.5% to 6%. And it can even go down to 4% for certain very large projects. That's a huge savings. That's a 40 plus percent savings right there. Um, third, um, there also can be some savings um, you derive from the millage rate um, change. Um, outside of the fee and lieu, millage is set annually, and it typically goes up anywhere from 1% to 3% a year, maybe even higher if, if, a, if an area builds a school, for instance. Inside of the fee, though, typically counties are willing to, to provide a fixed uh, lot millage rate for the entire term of that fee and lieu. So we talked earlier about a 30-year, 40-year fee and lieu. You can actually lock your millage rate in and, and avoid these 1% to 3% annual increases. Uh, by, by doing a fee in lieu. And there's another mechanism that's less common but more prevalent in some of the larger counties uh, who aren't as hungry. They provide individual five-year locks but maybe not a full 30-year lock. So there are some advantages of fee in lieu to taxpayers, just things to keep in mind. It's that massive reduction of the assessment ratio. Here's one thing also, we talked about rollback taxes and how that can be a serious number. Well, if, if the property is put into a fee in lieu, it, it completely eliminates rollback taxes. So that's another reason to do a fee in lieu. Uh, we've talked about the millage rate locking that that's available. And also for, an, for a company, it's, it's easier to predict what your tax payments are going to look like. Um, for a county, it's great because and we didn't talk about it, but you know, for, for counties, there is a, for manufacturers, corporate headquarters, and R&D, there is an abatement that's available where the county portion of the millage is abated for, for the first five years, just the county portion. Now, um, and that's in the non-fee and lieu world. If you're a county, that means you're not getting revenues for the first five years off of the project. So, you know, by putting it into a fee and lieu, that, that concept goes out the window and the county would still get its portion. So that's a selling point to counties for sure if you're representing a private industry. Um, there are some disadvantages. You could have some clawback payments if you don't satisfy some of the commitments. Of course, with all these things, you've got to make commitments, investment, and, and, and job creation typically. Um, you could have some true up payments due, um, and there's some limitations on, on what kind of property you can include. Now, now another concept is a multi-county park. I'm sure you all have heard of this. It's a multi-county business park, multi-county industrial park. It's basically a legal fiction where counties get together and put boundaries within one of these parks um, to, uh, the whole reason you do that is to, to provide additional incentives. But it's done by ordinance. Typically, private industry is not going to be a party to the proceedings, but is pushing the proceedings behind the scenes. Um, bottom line is, why, you know, when you buy, why bother with the multi-county park? The whole reason to do it is it, it, it allows the county to provide additional property tax incentives. Now, there are some income tax incentives that get, get sweetened as well. But from a property tax perspective, which is what we're talking about, it really facilitates probably the second most glamorous property tax uh, a reduction mechanism, and that's something called special source revenue credit. Um, and that's the acronym here, SSRC, special source revenue credit. So basically, a county can use a special source revenue credit and really make the taxes, to, um, you know, have them be at a level, any level they would like. There are no real limitations anymore on how much a, a county can reduce property taxes, not legal at least. Now, of course, you've got political um, implications there, but not legally. They, they can go as low as they really want to go. And now you don't have to have had a fee in lieu of tax to uh, arrangement to be able to provide special source revenue credits. You can do one or the other or both. Uh, many of the Bernie My projects, we will layer a special source revenue credit on top of a fee in lieu to provide even additional property tax savings. Um, so typically what you see is, you know, that there are, it's a percentage over a period of years of the payment, or sometimes you see flat dollar amounts, um, but those are the kind of examples of spe special source revenue credits that we often see. 
advantages. Again, it's a hard dollar incentive, like all property tax incentives are. Um, you know, you can decrease um, the payments to really whatever level you'd like. It's particularly useful if, if a company's cash strapped in the early years. You know, you can really make a, you know, a county can really make it easy on them in the early years, and maybe have the tax payments jump up in later years. There are drawbacks, just like there are with feeding loop. Clawback payments can kick in. Um, those can be significant, especially if a company is not. Uh, accounting for those and if it comes out of the blue, but nonetheless, it's still a quite a valuable incentive. And you can do fee and lieu on everything except for residential real estate. And so the counties are, have always done fee and lieu for manufacturers and warehouse and distribution. Some counties are dramatically more aggressive on special source credits than other counties. And you know, no surprise, the rich counties are a little, little tougher on special source credits. Where you're starting to see more and more on is on commercial property. Um, you can put a store into a fee and loo. You can put a mall into a fee and loo with a special source credit. Tusha and I represented several housing developers who got a, a very rich special source credit on student housing here in Columbia. And their, their argument simply put was all the other student housing was owned by the university and the local government didn't get a dime of property taxes. And then we also demonstrated to them how much higher property taxes were on student housing in Columbia versus Tallahassee, Charlottesville, Chapel Hill, Durham. And it really was a dramatic difference. Uh, and so you can't put, as a two sheriff said, you can't put existing buildings into it, but any new project of any size uh, is certainly worth considering, particularly where Location Matters says it, the real taxes on retail are the highest in the entire country. Um, so if you're looking at building a store on the North Carolina border or a Georgia border, uh, you know, it's a, it's a fairly dramatic difference. Moving on to the ATI alternative valuation, again, to state the obvious, you don't get paid till the property closes. We see quite a bit, the buyer really doesn't do his property tax due diligence until the very end. They do environmental due diligence and they do all kinds of due diligence, but he doesn't really start calculating the property taxes until the very end. And then he balks when he sees what his property taxes are versus his competitor, for example, across the street, he balks. And you saw that a lot in the recession. The buyer knew his taxes were going up and he knew he couldn't push them down to the tenants, even under a triple net lease, because the tenant would move. And so it's important uh, with this, uh, which I call Nick's Law, because it's actually a Nick Kermitis legislative provision, it's important to understand that ATI, whether you represent the buyer or the seller, so when the buyer starts balking at the taxes at the very end, um, or before, you can educate them that it's not, not nearly as bad as it looks. So ATI uh, came in in 2006 and 2000, actually ATI didn't come in in 2006, but Act 388 came in in 2006 and it, it dramatically changed uh, property taxes in South Carolina, mostly, mostly for the worse in my humble opinion. Uh, as before, county reappraisal takes place every five years followed by reassessment the following year. The, the Act 380 provides a 15% cap on any increase in fair market value when a countywide reassessment program is implemented. So if your house is worth 100 grand, it can't go up more than 115 grand. There are exceptions to that though. The 15% cap remains in effect until an ATI occurs. And an ATI will trigger a valuation not limited by the 15% cap. And that caused, uh, you know, if you've got a multifamily housing and your competitor across the street has a multifamily housing, uh, your taxes can be dramatically higher for the identical building where your property's been sold and his property hasn't been. So to soften the impact of the ATI provision, uh, a provision was put in for a partial exemption or alternative valuation for property added in 2011 and thereafter. And I'm not going to give, bore you with the minutiae of it, but basically you're entitled to the ATI value, the alternative valuation, the property must be subject to property tax before the ATI, so that pretty much excludes everything but something owned by a government or a charity or other exempt unit. The property must be subject to the 6% assessment ratio before and after, i.e. commercial property. And I'm not sure how many people are doing this for second homes, but a second home has a 6% assessment ratio. 
and the owner must notify the assessor that the property will be subject to the 6% assessment ratio before January 31st of the following year. So if you buy the property in 2015, you have to file your ATI form by January 31st of 2016. Now I have no less than seven appeals going before the administrative law court now where the buyer didn't pick it up the first year and then typically through uh, the accountant who's preparing the property tax return, somebody alerts the buyer to it and, uh, and of course he's missed, he missed the January 31st deadline. He applied thereafter and uh, the, the assessors have been uh, denying that. In my, one of my cases uh, this morning, the assessor for one county, the lawyer for the assessor for one county said that they were going to uh, back down and agree with us. Uh, but that's something to look at. Now, I'm not going to give you the rules because your head would explode with all of them. The easiest way to understand it is the examples. So let's say you have 6% property purchased uh, in 2000, in, um, purchased in 2000, in nine in Richland County after the last reassessment for four hundred thousand, it's increased in value according to the assessor's worth five hundred fifty thousand on December thirty first, twenty thirteen. Because of the fifteen percent cap, it was taxed in twenty thirteen with a value of four sixty. Let's suppose it was sold on January first for six hundred twenty five thousand. So we look at several variables. The current fair market value is five fifty. That was a tax assessor's valuation prior to the sale. The ATI fair market value is 625. That's what the purchaser paid for it. So the first example, does the ATI fair market value exceed the current fair market value? And if the answer to that is no, then you don't get any relief. The answer here is yes, 625 exceeds 550. Step two, you reduce the ATI fair market value by 25%. That equals 468,000. So 468,000 is the exemption value. Step three is the exemption value less than the current fair market value. Yes, because the exemption value uh, because the exemption value is less, we take the current fair market value. That is still a very good thing because the ATI fair market value was 625. So you don't get your 25% exemption, but you're taxed at 550 versus 625. Example two assume the same facts except the property was sold for 750. So current fair market value is 550, ATI is 750. Does ATI exceed current? Yes. As I said, if it didn't, you don't get anything. 750 exceeds 550. You reduce the ATI by 25%. That's 562. So 562 is the exemption value. Is the exemption value less than the current fair market value? No. Therefore, the exemption value, 562, becomes a taxable value versus 750,000. So under Nick's law, you're taxed until you sell the property again. You're taxed at 562, 500 versus 750. And if you add another digit to all of these numbers, you see we're talking about real, real money here. Um, example three, suppose it's sold for 525 because the ATI is less than the current fair market value, the ATI fair market value becomes a taxable value. So those are the three, three scenarios for um, alternative valuation. If you've got a client who's woken up to the fact they didn't file it timely, um, it's something at least one county has to date agreed with me. I have seven appeals going on that exact issue. Uh, and in those cases, they were billed in 13, 15, $20 million building, so it's indeed real money. And next to Sean, I'm going to go with the abandoned buildings and retail revitalization. Act. Thanks, Bernie. So, again, property taxes, a huge issue in South Carolina. And so, what we're trying to do in part um, with fee and lose special source revenue credits, and now some of these discussions, is we're trying to um, arm you with the tools to at least be able to have discussions and, and help make deals happen. Um, and help make deals financeable and make make business sense for, for your for the companies that are that are planning on locating here or expanding here. So these are two ways of doing that. Um, and one is the Retail Facility Revitalization Act. It was enacted in 2006. Um, so it's been on the books for a little while, and it actually sunsets 
um, next year. Um, then the second one is the Abandoned Buildings Revitalization Act. So it was something that came in, um, you know, the Retail Facilities Act was, was quite naturally tailored towards retail facilities um, and had some limit, limiting language in there to that effect. But the Abandoned Buildings Act really um, came in for a number of reasons, but one was to really deal with buildings that were not uh, abandoned retail facilities, of which we had unfortunately so many through South Carolina. So the General Assembly in their infinite wisdom um, in 2013 um, which just seems like it was yesterday, but it's been on the books for a little while, um, came in and, and passed a similar provision, but for, for abandoned buildings overall. Um, the Abandoned Buildings Act was just amended in this legislative session that Bernie touched on earlier. But the bottom line is both of these acts are really targeted at bolstering redevelopment of abandoned buildings. It's, it's really as simple as that. Uh, one is more targeted towards retail facilities. Um, now, of course, but the other one also is quite useful. Now, they're similar acts, but there are some very, very important differences between the two acts um, and incentives that can really be pitfalls for folks that aren't paying attention to the details. The devil's always in the details. So first, let's talk about really the basic incentives themselves. So on the re in the Retail Facilities Act, uh, a taxpayer who improves, renovates, redevelops an eligible site, that's the phrase that that act uses, an eligible site, um, can benefit from either an income tax credit or a property tax credit. Um, the Abandoned Buildings Act similarly um, provides incentives to a taxpayer who rehabilitates an abandoned building. That's their, the phrase in that statute, not eligible site. Um, abandoned building, again, it's either, either an income tax credit or a property tax credit. And the key similarity here is that both of the credits that are allowed under these two acts um, really are based on the level of rehab expenditures made in, in a project. Um, so, you know, and also there's some distinctions allowed for credits allowed for banks and uh, and now insurance premium taxes. Uh, there's also a credit for that as well. That was a new legislative change this year for what that's for. Um, so, on the eligible site, that is the phrase that's used by the Retail Facilities Act. And basically it defines it to be a shopping center mall, a freestanding site, um, the primary use of which was as a retail sales facility. So again, it limits it, uh, what were the kind of buildings that qualify. It had to have been at least one tenant, and it has to be at least 40,000 square feet or larger. Um, now there is, a, um, as you can see on the slide, a, an exception to that for the prop, one of the, the property tax credit that would actually allow you to get down to 25%. But this general, general provision is, is 40,000 square feet, in certain cases 25,000 square feet. Now, it's not, that's not good enough. It also has to have been abandoned, quite naturally. And, and under this statute, what that means is at least 80% of the structure must have been continuously closed to business or otherwise non-operational for a period of one year. Um, and, uh, and it really, if you, if you don't have at least one year of, of closed business um, for at least 80% of the structure, then, then this, this incentive may not work for you. Um, there are some exceptions. It could have served as a wholesale facility. So, you know, it doesn't have to be empty. It just has to be closed for business or otherwise non-operational uh, from, from a commercial perspective. So now the Abandoned Buildings Act um, uses that slightly different term. The abandoned, they call it an abandoned building. And it, again, the, the devil's in the details here. Um, it requires, um, so not 80% abandonment for one year, at least 66% of the space has to have been closed similarly closed for at least five years. So it's, it's a different, it, it's less of the building, but for a longer period of time. Now, um, the abandoned building, you know, if you have one large building, for instance, um, it can't actually be subdivided for purposes of this incentive. And there are some benefits to that for sure, uh, but there are some things to keep be mindful of as well. Um, not the least of which is some of the requirements we're going to touch on here apply to each of the subdivided properties if that's the route that, it, that, it, you know, that, that a company or a taxpayer wants to go. Um, you know, obviously the building cannot have immediately been, um, you know, proceedingly been a single family residence. There's some special provisions for uh, properties listed on the National, National Register of Historic Places. But a key distinction here is there is no square footage requirement, minimum square footage requirement. So whereas on the retail, you had 40,000 square feet, perhaps down to 25,000 square feet. Abandoned buildings, there is no such minimum square footage requirement. Um, for the condition of the site, this, this 
rule illustrates that the Act has several timing rules. So in addition to having to meet certain qualifications, you also have to meet certain timing rules. Under this example, if the uh, shopping center has the ceilings falling in and the walls are collapsing, it meets the definition of an eligible site. By contrast, if the facility's already been cleared except for the foundation, it doesn't meet the definition of an eligible site. So what the, the bottom line is the seller can't raise the building. The buyer can raise it. So if the abandoned building's there, when the buyer purchases it, it can raise it, but the seller cannot raise it. Um, another timing rule is the buyer can't sell before the building is placed in service. So the buyer buys the property, eligible site, makes eligible expenditures, but he sells it before it's been placed in service. Both he and the subsequent purchaser lose the credit all altogether. Um, on the abandonment, uh, according to the DOR's policy document, the shopping they give an example of, of the reach of the 80% requirement. A shopping center consisting of 400,000 square feet of space had four stores occupying 25%. It's been closed for making retail sales for over a year. However, one of the stores has been renting out its space to allow a third party retailer to store excess inventory. The shopping center does not meet the requirement that at least 80% of it is continuously closed because one of the store comprising 25% uh, have been using it. Um, on the certification, the taxpayer may now apply the municipality or county for a certification of the site. It's done by ordinance. I think the reason this was done is to those who've heard my lectures, um, you have to, the DOR is going to one day come in and audit every single one of the major abandoned building retail revitalization claims. I think it's just that simple. And they're going to send you a document request, and one of the document requests is going to be prove to us that the building that has been under the Abandoned Buildings Act been closed for five years. Well, you take the credit the year after the building's placed in service, the dealer's got three years to audit, so you're talking about a, a, the audit letter, that audit letter coming in four to five years after you started work, your records are long gone, it's going to be hard to prove that, to them that it's been abandoned for at least five years. So now you can get local government by ordinance to certify that it was abandoned. So I think that's quietly a fairly significant uh, uh, amendment. So as I said before, um, you know, the, the amount of the credit is is obviously key to, to all the taxpayers, right? But how do you, you know how do you calculate that credit? What is it based off of? It is based off of the amount of rehabilitation expenses that were actually put into the project. And it's not all the rehab, it's just the qualifying rehab as defined by these individual statutes. So that's an important pot of money to try to define um, and certainly define ahead of time. So under the retail facilities credit, uh, the qualifying rehab expenditures, um, it, you know, they're basically, it's pretty it's pretty broad. It simply says rehabilitation of the, you know, expenses incurred in the rehabilitation of the eligible site. That's, per, that's fairly broad. There are a couple of exclusions, um, you know, one of which is the cost of actually acquiring the eligible site, um, you know, and, and then another is the cost of the personal property that's actually maintained at the eligible site. So you can't put those into your pot for purposes of determining how much credit uh, that you're going to get, uh, but still it's a, it's a pretty broad statement overall. Now, what you'll see is, uh, if you were to look at the two different statutes, the abandoned building statute has is significantly longer and ha has includes significantly more detail. Now, that can be a good thing or a bad thing, but it's a common theme uh, when you're comparing both incentives. On the abandoned buildings credit, as you can see, the way it defines qualifying rehabilitation expenses uh, provides, a, you know, it provides significantly more detail on what can be included. So, for instance, you have your standard phrase, you know, expenses. Um, um, or capital expenditures. That's a key distinction, by the way, because um, you know it, 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 it removes any doubt as to whether soft costs can can be included, whether or not it ends up in, in a taxpayer's tax base. But any of those expenditures incurred in the rehabilitation, demo, reno, or redevelopment of the building site. Again, that's your standard broad statement, similar to retail. But then it adds some some meat to it and gives you some specific examples of things that are included. One of which is 
um, you know, environmental remediation. You've got site improvement work. You have the construction of the new buildings. So there are, there's a little more meat in there, particularly in that environmental remediation provision. Um, similarly, it does exclude the cost of, of acquiring uh, the building itself and the cost of the personal property. Um, so, uh, you know, the site improvement expenses only qualify if the building is obviously renovated, redeveloped. Um, and uh, a key provision here that Bernie's are going to touch on more is that rehabilitation expenses don't qualify um, to the extent that you're more than double, doubling the existing square footage on the site. The, um, we get asked that a question about an amazing percentage of the time the developer wants to expand the building. And so the first question is, well, and the statute says you can't do it more than double uh, uh, the original building. There was an argument that was actually 300% versus 200%. And we actually, Tushar and I actually got one of the deal lawyers to agree with us that it was 300%. But when they did the policy document, they say it's 200%. So the next question is, well, if you if you build if you expand the building more than 200 percent, do you blow the entire credit, or you just are not entitled to the excess? So the DOR's policy document says, no, you don't blow the entire credit, but you can't claim the excess. And they, in a, a very pro taxpayer fashion here, they allow you to allocate uh, the expenses, uh, the, the 300 the uh, qualify versus those that don't qualify. And there's some ways you can maximize it. If your heating and air conditioning, for example, is very expensive, you could just build that on the original building uh, site uh, and qualify it. Uh, but you do want to allocate the expenses that year. If you wait for the DOR to show up four years later, it's going to be very difficult to do those, to do those calculations. Um, on the income tax credit on the Retail Facilities Act, it's, and, and a lot of times we go through with clients, well, do you want to do abandoned building or do you want to do retail? And obviously the first thing you look at is the amount of credit and when you can take it. The retail is 10% of, of the rehabilitation expenses, it, uh, but you have to take it over an eight-year period. So that was done by the General Assembly to try and tap down the revenue impact of this bill. So you have to take it over an eight-year period, uh, but you can carry forward the unused credits for five years after that. So uh, you've got a long period of time with wind, with wind which to take the credit. The, on the abandoned buildings tax credit, it's 25 versus 10 percent of the rehabilitation expenses, and uh, you can now claim it over a three-year period. So you're talking about 25 versus 10 under retail, and you're talking about now three years versus eight years when it was placed in service. Uh, so you, up until this calendar year, you had to take it over a five-year period. Now you take it over a three-year period. You carry forward for five years, and the entire credit may not exceed $500,000 for any taxpayer in, in a tax year. And the cap uh, is no longer the credit's no longer capped at 50% of the annual income tax liability. So the abandoned buildings is generally superior over retail revitalization, except for the very largest project. So as we said before, um, th these both of these statutes provide for alternative um, prop, uh, credits. One is either an income tax credit, or or you can go the property tax credit route under each of these statutes. So Bernie just covered the income tax credit, so let's talk a little bit about property tax credit. A lot of entities don't have income tax liability or uh, or, or would prefer to receive the property tax credit as, as it's a hard dollar incentive, and so this can come in handy. As we'll see in a minute, there's a little more red tape involved with, with receiving the property tax credit, um, but it, it can be a sizable credit. Um, again, what we're trying to do with this is let's get those property taxes down as low as we possibly can. So um, under the retail property to, uh, facilities property tax credit provision, it is 25% of the rehab expenses. Again, earlier we said you know, defining that rehab expenses pot is extremely important. Well, it's 25% of the rehab expenses, and, and then it's multiplied by a phrase they use called the local taxing entity ratio, which bottom line is you know, what we have to do when we do these deals is we want all of the taxing entities to be, um, to be okay with the provision of the credit. And specifically, and most importantly, perhaps the school district, because it is the lion's share of the millage. 
uh, each taxing entity has the ability to opt out, um, but we've had success in, in having all of the taxing entities agree to it. Because if you think about it, what, what are we doing here? We're taking a building that's been abandoned and is largely an eyesore, and there are all kinds of issues that come with that, and it's not spinning off any jobs or spinning off any tax revenue for the county or the school district. Um, and now we're going to turn it into something much better. And, and so as a result, even after the incentive, the, the, the taxing districts will be much better off. We, we, Bernie and I have had success making that argument. But that's what the local taxing entity, entity ratio is, is how many of these taxing entities have signed on to providing the credit. And let's just assume it's 100% for purposes of this discussion. Um, so then it's going to be 25% of your rehab expenditure pot. Now, there is a cap that plays in here, and you're capped at 75% of the, of the real property taxes that are due on the eligible site each year for up to eight years. That's a huge incentive. Uh, that is akin to a 75% special source credit uh, for an eight-year period, which far exceeds what uh, many of the largest companies um, you know, in the state have received um, sta through standard economic development incentives. Um, so it is quite a rich special source credit, or a, a rich a property tax credit, I should say. Um, and you can, can begin claiming it in the, in the year that, the, uh, that it's placed in service. Now, on the abandoned building side, this is really where the, the, there's almost complete similarity between the two. Still 25% of the rehab expense, expenses, uh, the local taxing entity ratio still comes into play, um, still 70, up to 75% for eight years. So all that's pretty much the same. Now, both of these incentives, and this is, again, um, a pitfall here under both statutes, but specifically the abandoned building statute, it requires advance notice to the governmental entities. Um, so under the retail credit, um, again, it, it's much more user-friendly, I think, um, much, more, uh, much less restrictive, but basically a taxpayer just has to provide a notice to the DOR before the site is actually placed in service. So you know you're trucking along, and then really before you get, you get your CO, um, you know that's that's about the time that you have to let the DOR know, and you only have to do that if if, if the taxpayer is going the property tax credit route. Um, you know you don't have to do that if, if there's an income tax um, credit that the property or, uh, that the taxpayer is seeking. All you have to do there is just file it, um, you know, attach something to your income tax uh, return. Abandoned buildings, however, again, more detail as this, as this statute always requires, but it's a great incentive. Um, on the income tax side, you provide a, what's called a notice of intent to rehabilitate. And you have to do it before, um, you should do it before incurring the first rehab expenditures. And uh, the reason you should do it then, you don't have to, but you should do it then, is because only rehab expenses incurred after that notice is provided go into the pot for, de for determining how much the credit actually is going to be. Um, the same goes for the property tax credit, except the notice actually should be filed with the, with the municipality or the county. Um, but again, you have those same timing restrictions. And the notice of intent to rehabilitate must include um, you know, multiple pieces of information, location, amount of acreage, um, and perhaps most importantly, the estimated ex rehab expenditure budget. And that is a big, big deal um, because the amount of, you know, that you put in that notice, it, it's critical. And the reason for that is um, under the abandoned buildings credit, um, you know, you, you have to be between 80% and 125% of the estimated rehabilitation expenditure budget that you put in that notice. And remember, when you're doing the notice, you're doing it really early on in the project line, uh, timeline. Um, but if you don't fall within that window, um, you know, if you're over 125%, well, then your credit's only going to be based on 125% of the rehab expenditure budget or 125% of what you put in the original notice, I should say. So anything over that um, is really left out in the, in the cold, so to speak, for purposes of calculating the incentive. Now, the downside, um, the, the converse is also true. If you, if you're, if you actually come in below 80%, of the rehabilitation uh, budget estimate in the notice, then, you, then, then there's no credit allowed at all. And, and, that's, and that is a, um, a major issue, and uh, the DOR and its policy document has, has really restricted the ability to amend notices after the fact. So this is an important process, and one that Bernie and I have spent a lot of time with our clients on to make sure they get this notice, and particularly this issue, correct. The, um, well, the property tax approvals, 
if you've got an abandoned retail facility that you're renovating, you can't put it in a fee and loo because you can't put existing property into a fee and loo. If you plan, if the purchaser plans to raise a building and build a new building, they are eligible for a fee and loo. A lot of counties are still very reluctant to put retail in a fee and loo. Their, their major concern is really not the tax dollars, but the jealousy from every other retail owner in the county. So politically, they may be much more likely to grant the property tax incentive under the under retail or abandoned than they would a fee and lieu. And they have to approve the property tax credit. They have to do it by resolution. Retail requires a simple majority. Abandoned buildings requires a positive majority vote. Approval by a majority council members, whether present or, or not. On um, the a final, final approval by ordinance and public hearing is required. There's typically three readings. A notice has to be given. If the local, exactly like a TIF, if the school district doesn't file an objection to the credit or a county where it's in the city, if they don't file an objection, they're deemed to have consented to the credit. Um, and as a practical matter, uh, the, if you're doing it in a city, you want the city manager contacting the school district and the county and not you. Um, they typically are they're far more effective in doing that. And as a practical matter, you get their uh, consent before you start paying us. You know, you, they, the, the city would reach out to the school district, the county, and if the school district said not, no, but hell no, then there's no reason to start paying us. Uh, but if, if they do consent in advance, then the legal work actually starts. Uh, the also, locality is also required to find a credit will not violate the existing TIF covenant representation or warranty. And the abandoned buildings requires a finding as to extend outstanding general obligation debts. Those can be fairly serious issues, probably won't be, but they have the potential to be a, a fairly serious uh, issue. Um, and just something to think about. Pass through the income tax credit, a partnership or an LLC can pass through the credit to its partners or members and may allocate the credit in any manner. And typically the way you sell the credit, so to speak, is you, you get the, the heart surgeon to be a member of the LLC and then you allocate all of the credit to her or the vast majority of the credit to her. And she, of course, squares it up with you in some form some form or fashion. Um, retail revitalization credit says the allocation must be consistent with the Internal Revenue Code. The abandoned buildings code boldly says you can ignore the Internal Revenue Code, which basically means you can allocate the credit 99, 99 to 1. So transferability of these credits is a big issue for a lot of our clients. Um, and, and the statutes uh, specifically allow for, for certain types of transfers and then are silent on others. Um, so, so, you know, you can, you can, you know, there's some gray areas certainly as it relates to transfers, but under the retail facilities credit, um, uh, it specifically allows for transfer of, of both the income tax credit or, and the property tax credit, whichever one, you know, the taxpayer has initially qualified for. Uh, but it's interestingly only specifically allowed to a tenant of the eligible site. Um, you know, and DOR must receive written notice and approve the transfer. On the other side, uh, abandoned buildings credit provides specifically, again, only specifically for transfer of the income tax credit. Uh, but it does, in, interestingly, trans, uh, approve transfers to both the tenant and the purchaser of the site. Uh, again, the, uh, there's similar DOR notice requirements, but uh, the abandoned building statute is silent as to whether the DOR actually has approval rights. Uh, so just a couple of things to keep in mind about the abandoned buildings uh, provisions. Again, you know, th this is an act that, that is, we have found to be much more valuable to our clients, but there's a little more red tape. Um, you know, the taxpayer is not eligible for the credit if it owned the building site, you know, quite naturally if it owned the building site when it was operational and immediately prior to its abandonment. Um, now, there, there are some stacking rules that play into here. You can't stack uh, the income tax credits. Uh, you know, with, with the Retail Facilities Credit uh, Act and then the Textile Communities Act, uh, but it does allow for stacking with any other credits. So there are ways, we've had projects, you know, try to get the income tax credit under maybe the Retail Facilities Act and then the property tax credit under the abandoned buildings or vice versa. You can, you can do income and property together, 
on one project under two different statutes, but there are some limitations on stacking property and property or income and income. Um, of course, it only applies to abandoned building sites that are actually put into operation for income producing purposes. Um, there are some special provisions in for charter schools and, and other parochial schools saying that they qualify. And of course, construction of a single family residence does not qualify for the incentive. The, the bottom line is the revenue impact of abandoned building and retail revitalization has been so large, it will be so large there is a near 100% chance that the larger credits are going to be audited by the Department of Revenue. They'll pick some income, they'll pick some dollar figure of the credit and audit everything above that. So you have to have all your ducks in line. Bear in mind, the audit's not going to come till three, at least three years after you start construction, and maybe five years later. The has got three years to audit you. You got one year to file a tax return. So you're talking about four or five years after you start work. So you need to establish a permanent file on uh, on each of the uh, the things that are required. You know, five, when they come five years later after you finish the building, you're not going to have your books and records readily available. How are you going to prove this line on a construction contract with real or personal property? How are you going to prove the building was abandoned, et cetera, et cetera? So you want to you and then. The second thing that's happened is people paid, developers paid too short an eye for the first project. They said, ah, that looked pretty easy. I'll just do the second project myself. I'll just roll over too short documents and I'll just do this one myself without realizing all of the nuances. So get your books and records together, make a permanent copy of them and, uh, and have them available. The next is the, the original income tax credit and for many years the only income tax credit for real estate developers. It allows a credit against corporate income tax and it's now all entities, not just corporations, for 50% of the contributions or expenses paid for the construction of water, sewer, or road projects that are dedicated to public use or a qualifying private entity. Now you're all saying, well, gee, we see those all the time. None of my clients are taking it. What they're doing is they're just looking at the credit amount and they're wrong. It says the credit's available but limited to $10,000 per project per year. Any unused credit for $30,000 may be carried forward for three years. The maximum credit for each project is $40,000. They say that's just not worth fooling with. Um, and I'll come back to not worth fooling with. But it's got a, the water sewer lines can exclusively benefit the taxpayer. There's a very pro taxpayer view of that have to be built to applicable standards dedicated to public use. Um, and um, you can, you, usually you can take it when you give it to the, the, um, the public entity, but in some cases you can take it, you can take it earlier. Um, where, where your people are missing it, and it's a matter of public record, so I can tell you, I represented Syntex. Syntex did $30 million worth of public infrastructure improvements was not aware of the credit at all until one of their um, accounting firms alerted them to it and they filed a tax refund for six million dollars and they would have won it the DOR did not contest the six million dollars but they the, the payments were made by partnership not the corporation which at that time had to be made by the corporation now the statute has been amended is now purely the corporate income tax Credit. So you say, well, if it's limited to forty thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars per project, how do you how do you get six million dollars? Well, one road can be multiple projects. One sewer can be multiple projects. Uh, one water can be multiple projects. And there's no limitation. So you can take one real estate subdivision and carve it into numerous numerous credits that, that add up. Uh, and I won't go through all of the details of that, but uh, um, just be aware you can you can maximize that. You take it the year in which it's deeded or dedicated to a qualifying entity, not the year in which the expenses were incurred. So you can file a refund claim going three years back, and uh, you, you may see that you've got some, uh, within the last three years is when you deeded or dedicated. You did the work five or six years ago, 
but you needed it last year. So that's uh, that is it. Do we have uh, any questions that we want to get answered? Yeah, we got a couple. Um, will the transfer of an interest in an LLC or LMT PS trigger ATI? Uh, well, no, unless it's 51%. And the Act 388 incredibly says you have to keep records for 25 years. So if you transfer, if in the 24th year you transfer an LLC membership interest, which equals 51%, earlier you've transferred 49%, uh, 50%, and someone gets a divorce and you transfer another 1%, you're supposed to notify the the assessor and the DOR, and there's a penalty if you don't. Uh, if you train, if if you've got 100 LLC membership interests and you only transfer 10, no, it does not trigger ATI. I used to tell clients, by the way, in the height of the recession, where their property was grossly valued, transfer the LLC membership interest to trigger ATI, um, but, but you want it revalued. Um, but that's that. Next. Um, I've noticed several large abandoned retail spaces being remodeled into churches. Are there any tax laws that are important for these types of transactions? Well, the the um, the typically the church does it. The church would do the remodeling and they do the construction, they do the renovation, and of course churches don't get an income tax credit of any sort. Uh, if the developer did, uh, it was an abandoned building, and the developer did all the work and sold it to the church, it still probably wouldn't qualify because it has to be used for commercial use. Now, where the developer leased it to the church, that might qualify, um, and particularly if it was a fair market value type. But if he's, the developer did it and sold it, um, you wouldn't have abandoned or retail revitalization. That key, right. that key verbiage is income producing. It must be income producing. Um, how does a commercial owner appeal their property taxes? They have to do it on a timely basis. And so they get a tax, they get a proposed assessment and they have 30 days to appeal it. And sometimes if the value doesn't go up, they, they hope to get the tax bill and they have to appeal it off of that. The most raging debate going on in the property tax world right now is can you appeal your property taxes in a non-reassessment year? The Department of Revenue and the Attorney General's opinion say you cannot. You can only appeal it unless there's an ATI or a uh, reassessment year. You can only appeal in those years. I think that's wrong, uh, but that's what you're up against today. Um, so if you're in a not, you get a top property tax bill, all the property, for example, all the property around you has plummeted in value through ATIs, uh, and you think your value is too high, if it's a non-reassessment year, you've got issues whether you can appeal it. Um, does Nexon Pruitt uh, Law Firm offer additional education classes or continuing education classes for realtors on real estate topics? We, we have three seminars a year. They're free. They're approved by LLR, which is a huge pain in the keister, I might add. <laughs> uh, we do one in Charleston, one in Columbia, and one in Greenville. We always do them in the springtime. The last one in Charleston, we, you know, we ask everyone to RSVP and no one RSVP. So we canceled the Charleston one, but we had one in Greenville and, and uh, Columbia, and we did the prior year as well. And the key on those, as Bernie said earlier, is the, w the way you find out about those largely is from Bernie's uh, uh, eblast listserv. So to the extent that you want to receive those invitations and are not getting the, uh, on the, the realtors, uh, real estate professional listserv, then um, you know, let Bernie or I know, and we'll make sure to add you. And uh, we, our topics are exclusively of interest to industrial commercial realtors. We don't deal with residential issues. I think that's it. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all. Thank you for your time.